Kristen Dine from the great state of Texas for her five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Landsman just quoted from today's um, SCOTUS opinion, but it's important to highlight exactly what you were saying, that neither the individual nor the state plaintiffs have established Article 3, which is standing. This means that they did not have standing to sue. This is not a decision based on the merits. Ms. Youngest, would, you are a constitutional. Can you give us some clarity on this? Sure. Actually, I'm uh, one of the lawyers on the case, so I know it well. Uh, this was also limited to the preliminary injunction. They said because a preliminary injunction is about forward-looking relief and they hadn't, the plaintiffs hadn't established a likelihood that they would be harmed in the future because some of these programs appeared to be ending. So this is not about the merits. The court actually specifically said it was not expressing a view as to the merits. Uh, the case will continue in the, in the district court. Um, and uh, I suppose that's, that's essentially the issue, is this is limited to the preliminary injunction. Uh, they are not saying that the, that the government didn't do anything wrong. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. I wanted to make sure that that was clarified and not just cut off. The State Department's so-called Global Engagement Center, which is exactly what we're here to talk about today, has spent millions of taxpayer dollars to silence American small businesses who do not share their liberal political beliefs. The CEO of the Global Disinformation Index even admitted that this list has, quote, significant impact on the advertising revenue, unquote, on the company, showing that they are knowingly attempting to destroy livelihoods of those with which they disagree. Meanwhile, the Global Disinformation Index scores NPR as one of the least risky outlets, citing its, quote, neutral fact-based content. Contradicting GEI's rating, an NPR staffer who worked there for 25 years wrote about his experiences at NPR and highlighted the level of bias that GDI failed to recognize. This article said that when stories NPR labeled as disinformation turned out to be credible, such as the legitimacy of the Hunter Biden's laptop and the COVID-19 lab leak theory, that NPR, quote, pretended it never happened and performed no self-reflection. Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to enter the full article into the record. The Biden administration has pledged to be the most transparent administration in history, but instead we found, our, we found that they've been stonewalling our requests time and time again because they know exactly what they're doing and they're using improper use of taxpayer funds, if not completely unethical um, and, and illegal. We will continue to expose this administration's extremist agenda and their lawless acts as we work to provide accountability for American small businesses. I was stunned, Ms. Franks, that you had to say that, oh, they haven't been imprisoned. Is that now the bar that we're setting? So we're fine bankrupting these, these, these businesses. We're fine blacklisting them. We are fine shutting them down and silencing their voice, but at least they're not being imprisoned yet. Mr. Weingarter, do you think- Sorry, was that a question for me? No, it's, it's not a question. I'm just flabbergasted at your statement. Well, Mr. Weingarter, you do you think the Global statement. Disinformation Index is a fair assessment? I don't, but even if it was, the government shouldn't be funding it. So given that opinions are often difficult to separate from fact and that facts evolve over time, would it even be possible to assess the accuracy of a media outlet in a truly objective fashion? It's an inherently subjective exercise. Outlets put out news and views that are varying, and to have some sort of ministry of truth or ministries of truth out there with the government's blessing is incredibly chilling. So why is it an issue that the federal government is funding supposed fact-checking organizations? Because effectively, this amounts to a bridging of speech by proxy. Even if you couldn't draw a straight line from a government official saying, take down XYZ speech, the government is effectively giving its blessing through its funding to these entities, which exist, to put out a business, some entities, and also, by the way, effectively provide a subsidy to the protected, whitelisted publications as well. So it's a dual-edged sword. It's picking winners and losers de facto with government funding. But it's picking winners, winners and losers based on what? Well, it seems clear when you look at the breakdowns of how the scores come out based upon ideology. Viewpoint diversity is antithetical, it seems, to these entities. So Ms. Frank said that, that typically what happens is it benefits conservative news outlets. Has that been your experience? Is that what you've seen? We've seen ratings to suggest NewsGuard's ratings reviewed large samples of both right-leaning and left-leaning publications, and it comes out that the left-leaning publications rank substantially higher, 25-plus points higher on NewsGuard's 100-point scale than right-leaning publications. Can you give any examples of right-wing publications that they have um, disparaged? 
Uh, well, for well, <laughs> they cast, I guess, real queer politics and real queer investigations as having an undisclosed conservative bias. But of course, this includes uh, the Federalist. I think probably what well, the Daily Wire, Town Hall, I believe, a slew of other so-called right-leaning entities as well. Excellent. Thank you, Anna Yield. Lady Yield's back, and now I recognize uh, Representative Crane from the great state of Arizona. 